Good morning. We're back, I think. Um, I hope you agree that yesterday was uh, has had some uh, quite special moments. Uh, I thought uh, uh, Chris Whitty particularly was uh, uh, was uh, really impressive, and I felt somewhat reassured that uh, uh, whatever happens with coronavirus, uh, there are some grown-ups in the room to quote the, uh, uh, which which is which is reassuring. I noticed we had one question for Chris Whitty and uh, on coronavirus, and two for Simon Stevens. So presumably we'd carried on like that. We'd then have had four and sixteen and. Um, uh, <laughs> um, there are some researchers who, whenever I see they've written a blog or published a paper, I will make a point of uh, going and seeing what they've got to say. Because it, and in this particular case, it's always interesting and it's always insightful. So, I, when I discovered that Ashley Shah was in Europe on a sabbatical looking at European health systems, I thought, let's get him to come and talk about something. And he said, well, what do you want me to talk about? And I said, well, just come and talk about something interesting, and it will, because I know it'll be interesting. So he's, we're going to focus on, at first on uh, what's been happening in the US reforms, but we'll also get an opportunity to ask him to reflect a bit on some of the things he's been seeing uh, in the early stages of his uh, grand tour of Europe. So without further ado, Professor Ashish Jha. Thank you. Thank you, Nadal. All right, excuse me. Good morning, everybody. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so what I'm going to try to do over the next 20 to, my voice is not starting off quite right. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so what I'm going to try to do over the next 20 to 25 minutes um, is cover the landscape of what's been happening with U.S. health reform in the last decade, um, what is happening now, and where things are going. And my hope is that, that it's a nice segue into a conversation with Nigel um, about uh, what, it, what America can and can't learn from looking at European health systems. And I've organized this talk by really thinking about five common myths that I have seen uh, over time about, uh, about where the state of, of US healthcare is. So let's, uh, let's get started. And I'm gonna basically try to talk about Obamacare and two myths around Obamacare. Uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's happening under the Trump administration and, and lay out what I think is a commonly held belief. Uh, then I'm gonna spend about uh, two, three minutes talking about what the main myths are about American healthcare spending and why it's so out of control. And then the myth number five is hard to argue it's a myth because it's a prediction about the future and maybe it's not a myth. So we'll, we'll do that together and you guys can tell me whether you think it's a myth or not. All right, so why do we have a lot of myths about Obamacare? And I, when I think about this in the American context and I talk to, to policy people in the US, um, basically most people's views of Obamacare come out to one of two ways of looking at things. One is the, this is great. This has really solved all of our issues. Obamacare is working, it's doing a great job. Here's a picture of a smiling president, uh, you know, great picture, and, and the sense that like, we finally made real progress on American healthcare. There's the other view, which is it's an unmitigated disaster, and it has destroyed the fabric of our society, and we have to uproot it and get rid of it. And these two views continue to sort of dominate the American health policy landscape. And what I'm gonna to try to do is lay out what I think is really to look at the facts and say what is happening with Obamacare. We're approaching the 10th anniversary. And there are lots of ways of summarizing what a decade of Obamacare has meant. And I'm gonna to try to take this on by covering it in two ways. First is a myth that is widely held by the left and right, which is that the ACA, Obamacare, was a hodgepodge of policy ideas. I, I know almost nobody who thinks it's an elegantly crafted bill, surgically targeted towards the problems of America. Whether you're on the left or right, you tend to look at this and say, what a complete mess. Why would anybody create a bill like that? So I'm gonna argue that that's actually a myth and that there is good reasons to think that this is an elegantly crafted bill. And so let's talk about that. Let's imagine it's February 28th, 2010. So exactly a decade ago from today. By the way, that's, you guys probably know the ACA was passed on March 20th, uh, 2010, so we're getting very, very close to the 10th anniversary. If you looked at the problems of US healthcare in 2010, you would talk about the problems around access, problems around costs, and problems around quality. By the way, same thing in every country in the world, right? But if you said, well, what are the specifics? Back in 2010, we had about 47 million people who were uninsured. 
and another 30 to 50 million who are underinsured. So close to 30% of Americans who are either uninsured or underinsured. And then we're staying with 2010. If you ask the question, who were these people? Who's uninsured and underinsured? They basically fell into four categories. There were young people, there was the working poor, there were chronically ill people with pre-existing conditions, and there were undocumented immigrants. Those are your four buckets of people who were underinsured or, or, or largely uninsured in America. And so if you look at the ACA or, the, or Obamacare, it basically was two bills in one. The first one focused on access. How, we were going to expand coverage. And I'm going to talk about both of these in a second in more detail. The second one was around cost and quality. So if we just focus on the first, on the issues of access, and ask what's in Obamacare. I'm assuming that most of you have heard some version of what are the major features of the Affordable Care Act. I think of the major features as having kind of a few components. First was that people under 26 could stay on their parents' health insurance. There was Medicaid expansion for people who were really poor. FPL stands for Federal Poverty Line. And then there was a series of things around insurance exchanges, community rating, essential health benefits, individual mandate that I tend to call insurance reform. Basically, the ACA created a whole different way of buying and selling health insurance in America. So really, three major efforts. <clears throat> Excuse me, and as I said, most people look at this and say, this is really messy. This is really complicated. Why do this in such a complicated way? And if you look again at who was uncovered in 2010, I told you it was young people. And so this policy of people under 26 staying on their parents' insurance was really meant to pick off that group. We had the working poor, and the Medicaid expansion was targeted towards them. And then we had chronically ill people with pre-existing conditions, and we had insurance reform and exchanges that was targeted towards them. The one group that we did leave out was undocumented immigrants. The ACA did nothing for that. And so I look at the ACA and its components, and I, my basic argument is, they looked at who was there, who was missing coverage, and then created very smartly targeted policies that went after each group to try to provide coverage for each one in a cost-effective way. And you can ask the question, well, did it work? Did it make a difference? And if you look at the US uninsured rate over the last two decades, basically what you see is that we have been hanging out about 15 16% for quite a long time. And then here we are at 16% when the ACA is passed. And then here's what happens. So two points from this. One is we covered, we almost halved the uninsured. And if the Medicaid expansion, which was supposed to be national, actually it happened in states like Texas and Florida, two of the biggest states that haven't expanded Medicaid, that 8.6% would have fallen to about 5 or almost 4%. The other point on this is that the Trump administration may be the only one in modern history that has managed to increase the uninsured rate during a time of economic boom. It's actually a pretty hard thing to pull off, um, but they have managed through both incompetence and maliciousness to undermine the ACA enough that the uninsured rate has gone up, and there's some reason to believe that in 2019 and 2020, this number is gonna continue to rise. Okay, so that to me is the argument for the ACA on coverage has really worked pretty well. It's got issues. We gotta make more progress. Let's talk about healthcare spending. So if you look at healthcare expenditure in the US, you've all seen versions of this. Um, healthcare spending before the ACA, so 2010 again is the, is the marker for the Affordable Care Act, um, had been rising faster than the economy. The only point I want to make on this, this is in billions of dollars, so we were at about 2.6 trillion uh, back in 2010. If you look at spending growth, one of the key points that should become obvious is that spending growth was starting to slow down before the ACA. So a lot of people who come and say the ACA has made a big difference in spending growth are not really actually looking at what was happening right before. And the ACA did a whole lot of things, and I'm not going to get into a lot of details here because I could easily give a 45-minute talk on like, delivery reform in the ACA. But it made a bunch of efforts to change how we pay things, like value-based payments, put in a bunch of new accountability programs like ACOs and bundled payments, and it enabled innovation through a new center at Medicare. 
And one of the things that the advocates, the people who love to say the ACA is working, one of the things that they love to talk about is how the ACA has really slowed healthcare spending growth. And there are lots of charts you can use, but I believe, in my opinion, that this is largely a myth. And the easiest way to see this in my mind is to begin by looking at the national health expenditures over the last 13 years. And if you look at the pre-ACA era, that's what was happening. And if you look at the post-ACA era, now if you can see a bending of the cost curve and healthcare spending slowing down in that graph, you have better eyes than I do. I don't. In fact, there's a little inflection up, and that represents bringing about 20, 25 million people into the healthcare system through coverage. When you cover people, they spend more money because they have health needs and health needs addressing them cost money. So the ACA, in my mind, has had little to no impact on healthcare spending. Um, and this is just growth before versus growth after. The other major thing the ACA did, of course, was try to do a whole bunch of quality reform efforts, pay for performance programs, a whole set of them, um, and they have largely failed. And again, I'm trying to summarize about 150 studies with one line. Um, which is difficult, and you'll have to trust me, but I'm happy to get into it in a conversation uh, after. But if you look at this whole set of hospital VVP, readmissions, hack penalties, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the average net effect of all these policies is zero. Um, they've had no impacts on quality and cost. But actually, I shouldn't say the average net effect has been zero. They have had effects. Most of the penalties have gone to safety net hospitals and teaching hospitals. So while they have not improved quality, they have penalized people who take care of poor and sick people. You could argue it's not exactly the effect we were going for. Um, there are areas where the ACA has made a difference. Um, where we've seen real progress is on bundle payments and accountable care organizations. And I'm happy to, again, get into more details on any of this. Um, but the bottom line is that there are areas where we're starting to see small gains, small improvements. But there has not been any major national impact on spending or quality coming out of the ACA. And what's ironic is a lot of people who are advocates of the ACA say, well, you know, everybody focuses on coverage, and we haven't made a ton of progress there. Um, but where we have made real progress is on cost and quality. I actually think it's the opposite. We've made real progress on coverage, which is great. We have got to do more. Um, but we've made very little progress on cost and quality. At least that's my reading of the data. Um, Myth number three, and this is the one that will probably get me into a little bit of trouble, is that the Trump administration has done nothing good on health policy. So when we talk about Trump administration's efforts, it's usually headlines like this, healthcare defeat is a stunning setback for Republicans. They spent years trying to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, right? And every single time you thought that that repeal effort was dead, somehow they would once again come up with another way to try to repeal the ACA, and it would get very, very close. And each effort has failed, and I think each effort has failed, uh, has been a political disaster, and, and, and that's because they don't have a replacement plan. And it's really hard to take coverage away from millions of Americans if you have no plan to do anything about an alternative. And this is the thing that has gotten all the attention. But there have been a whole series of less visible efforts within the Trump administration that I think are worth at least acknowledging and lauding. And let me just say, I'm, generally, I try not to be an overly political person. Um, I want to be very clear. I think Trump, Donald Trump himself, is a moral stain on our nation and has been an unmitigated disaster for policy in our country. I know I, I was going to say, was that a little, was, that, was I hedging too much? I apologize. I'm not a fan. I don't plan to vote for him in 2020. Um, but, what, but because of his incompetence and because of the inability of the White House to generate any useful policy on health care, what it has done is it has created a political space for people in agencies to do things. Now, when they've had good people in agencies, they're doing good things. When they've had incompetent people in agencies, they're doing incompetent things. And it turns out that actually at CMS, the most important health agency in America, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they happen to have some good people, smart people. I don't always agree with them, but pretty smart people. And they have taken on topics that the Obama administration, unfortunately, I think, refused to take on. 
And so they have done some really interesting work around price transparency rules, which are about to come into effect, which finally will open up and make very clear the craziness of healthcare spending in America in a way that we haven't before. Um, they have taken the ACA, Obamacare ideas, around ACOs and bundles and redoubled their efforts in some smart ways. And they've gone in directions that I wish the Obamacare, or, or the Obama administration had gone. Um, they have been finally pushing for interoperability and making IT systems work better in a way that was not politically possible under the Obama administration. And they've been taking on a whole bunch of special interests around quality and saf safety, et cetera. It turns out that what CMS has been doing is pretty good. And in many ways, they've been able to do things that the Obama administration wasn't able to do. Because in any administration, you have the wonks and the po political types, and they fight it out, and you come to some sort of a compromise. But the White House is such a policy disaster under the Trump administration that the wonks are getting to run the day. And sometimes that's terrible, but sometimes you can actually get something useful out of it. And so that's what I think has been happening here. And you know, it's not popular to say that the Trump administration is doing something useful. Uh, but I think when it comes to American health policy, they actually are. All right, a couple more, and then we will wrap up. So one of the standard myths of American health care, oops, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that, is that the main problem of US health care is overutilization. And this is where I'm going to get a bit into international comparison. So you guys have all seen versions of this slide. Here's American health care spending as uh, percent of GDP compared to other countries. This is actually the slide that every health policy talk in America begins with. We spend more than everybody else. And those countries are, you know, Switzerland's number two, we know, and France and Germany and Sweden, et cetera. So the question is why? Why does America spend so much more than everybody else? And if you grab a random health policy expert in America from the political left or the political right, you essentially get one of these answers that the problem is fragmentation or fee-for-service or it's for-profit greed or it's lack of transparency or if you're on the more right side of the political aisle, that it's lack of enough skin in the game, that people are overinsured, and that means they overutilize. But what has been amazing to me is the remarkable degree of consensus in American health policy that the problems of American healthcare spending are problems of overutilization, just doing too much. And so the only equation I have this morning is this one, which is total spending is quantity times price. And the broad consensus has been that the problem is quantity, that we have a high quantity healthcare system uh, that is out there go going crazy, doing all these services that people don't need. So the question is, is overutilization the main problem of US healthcare? Do we actually use more care than other countries? So let's talk about this, and I want to just talk a little bit. This is my kind of one foray into overutilization, and then we'll um, wrap up with predictions about the future. So one theory has been that we are quick to go to the doctor, that Americans, the moment they get sick, the moment they have a little back pain, a little sniffle, they're off to the doctor. This is something that Americans talk, people talk about all the time in American policy. So this is from some work that we did recently where we looked at American healthcare utilization compared to other countries, and what you find is that when it comes to doctor visits per population, the mean across these 11 countries is about six and a half per population. Um, the average American sees the doctor four times a year. By the way, I've always been struck by what's happening in Japan and Germany. Many of you may know this. Um, but the average Japanese goes to see the average, the, uh, a doctor 13 times a year. It's remarkable. It's once every four weeks for the average. And for every 25-year-old Japanese who never goes to see the doctor, there's somebody else going once every other week, right? Even Germany is, is quite high, and America's really on the low end. So when I show this data to people, they say, ah, actually, that's the problem. You see, we don't go to the doctor enough. We knew that. Um, and that means not enough prevention, not enough primary care, and though we're spending all of our time in hospitals. In fact, I heard this earlier this week from an expert said, well, you know, the problem of American healthcare is not enough prevention not enough primary care, and that's why the hospitals are always full in, in the US. So we said, well, we should be able to look at that. So here's what hospital discharges per population look like, and here's the mean across all these countries. And it turns out America's actually below average. By the way, Germany, um, keep your eye on Germany. Um, actually, it's an important phrase that we could always use, but keep your eye on Germany. I shouldn't have said that. Um, 
really high utilizers of hospital care, also high utilizers of, of, of uh, ambulatory care. But it turns out, okay, hospital discharges, and then you guys probably know this, but of all these countries, which country has the shortest length of stay? America. So combine low number of discharges with short lengths of stay, and Americans are actually spending a lot less time in hospitals than almost any other country. So fewer doctor visits, fewer hospitalizations. Some people are like, ah, the real issue is tests and procedures. And here, there is some data. So if you look at MRIs per population, here's the mean, and here's America. We're on the high side. Germany, it's interesting. Um, knee replacements, America turns out, by the way, I could do this all day. I have like 35 of these, but I won't, I won't torture you. Um, on knee replacements, America is actually number one. Um, partly because we have a lot of obesity, and obesity is a major risk factor for osteoarthritis, which is why people need their knees replaced. So that's pretty high. And then I would have thought that the same thing would show up on the hip replacement, and it turns out actually not so much. And the Swiss and the Germans are doing a lot of hip replacements. Coronary angioplasty, another procedure that seems to get a lot of attention. Here's America, a little bit on the high side, about the same as the Dutch and the French. And there are the Germans. They are a high utilizing country, by the way. So the bottom line is this entire story, remember all the reforms I showed you in the ACA, were all built on trying to reduce overutilization. The entire narrative of American healthcare has been that we spend too much because we do too much. And it turns out that it's not true. It's a great story, just not quite right. So we have fewer hospitalizations and doctor visits, um, we do more of MRIs and re knee replacements, but fewer of other things. And the way I look at it is if I looked across 30 different measures of utilization, America is above average on some things, below average on other things, and on average, it's pretty average. So utilization is not the big driver of American healthcare spending. So what is it? Um, it turns out if we go back to our one equation, um, there's another part of this, which is price. So if you look at prices of healthcare in America, this is total drug spending per capita. Americans don't use more pharmaceuticals than Europeans, but they pay more. And that's often the culprit that gets attention. But it turns out it's not just drugs. This is CAT scans. By the way, $85 for a CAT, span, a CAT scan in Spain. I mean, feels to me like at that price, it's, you know, um, we should all like get on a plane, go to Spain, get a little abdominal pain on the way, no big deal. Just you can get the CAT scan for $85, which is remarkable. Um, appendectomies, here's, you know, here are some really cheap countries like Switzerland um, at $6,000 and America at two and a half times. And I could do this all day as well, but some interesting things to think about. Part of the reason our healthcare spending is so high is because our generalist physicians get paid more, our specialist physicians get paid more, our nurses get paid more. Everybody in American healthcare gets paid more. So what is the problem of US healthcare spending? To quote a, a colleague of, I'm sure many of you, um, a, a mentor and friend of mine who passed away a couple of years ago, Uwe Reinhardt, it's the prices. Stupid. Um, policymakers have almost entirely ignored, there was supposed to be another word, uh, ignored this issue, and that's why we've made so little progress on healthcare spending. All right, I'm gonna finish up in two minutes just by making uh, the following, um, which is that the standard line in American politics is that 2020 is shaping up to be the healthcare election, and that finally after 2020 we're going to get national health reform. And you have people, our Democratic fundraiser, who has been very I'm done, fundraiser, front runner, uh, our Democratic fun, front runner and fundraiser. He's actually raised quite a bit of money. Um, has been very very clear that this is the time, and we should look for, towards countries like Denmark. If you look at the reality on the ground, this is my one effort to do prediction of what's gonna happen with American health policy. Um, there are three scenarios of what happens. There are a hundred scenarios, but three most likely. One is you get a Democratic president and a Democratic Senate. Could happen, uh, looking less and less likely each day, but could happen. Um, I think we're gonna see some efforts to introduce Medicare for all. I don't think they're gonna go anywhere. Um, and ultimately, I think what you're gonna end up with is, is policies that strengthen the Affordable Care Act. If you get a Democratic president and a Republican Senate, which is a bit more likely, um, most of the policy efforts are gonna be trying to shore up the Affordable Care Act through a bunch of policies. And if you get a Republican president and a Republican Senate, 
Um, there will be, I think, again, new efforts to repeal the ACA. I think they're going to go nowhere because the Republicans have no consensus on what they want to do. The Democrats don't have much consensus either, but at least there's enough of a view of we've got to strengthen the ACA and then maybe try to do Medicare for all. Um, on the Republican side, it's just, a, it's just a policy disaster. And so every few months, Trump comes out and says, we're going to have a new health care bill. And it never shows up because they don't know what they want to do. And so what is going to happen, I think, if we do indeed get a Republican president and Republican Senate, is all the movement towards health reform is going to move to states. And states are going to be the kind of place where you're going to see lots of innovations. You might see some states go to single payer. You're going to see other states uh, try to unravel uh, a lot of the gains of the ACA. It's going to be a hot, that is going to be a hodgepodge over the next uh, few years if, the, if Trump is reelected. All right. Oops. So, uh, sorry, I don't know why number two showed up first. Let me actually put all three. Um, so I don't think there are uh, there's an appetite for radical changes. Where I think we're going to get efforts is around drugs and out-of-network billing, and I'm happy to talk about this, but these are the two things that have a lot of policy attention right now in the U.S., high prescription costs. And then we have this crazy thing called out-of-network billing. For anybody who's been following American policy, I, I can talk more about it, but it is really crazy, and, and a lot of Americans are hit by it. And I don't think either the Democrats or the GOP is going to put a lot of political capital. So finishing up, last slide, and then I'm, I know I'm over. Um, I think the Affordable Care Act has actually provided a very strong point for American health policy reform. Um, I believe, and I'm one of the, I may be the only person I know who says this, but I think it was elegantly designed to target very specific issues. It has made huge progress on coverage, not enough, but big, but not done much on costs. Um, the Trump administration has been surprisingly active on costs and quality, uh, continuing many of the ACA ideas and pushing new ones. Um, I think over the next uh, few years, we're going to have to tackle prices. Um, it's really extraordinary, the price problem of American health care. Um, I don't see 2021 uh, as the health care revolution year, but an evolution that I think builds towards a better, more universal system. All right. Thank you very much. I'm a couple of minutes over. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, tour of the territory. I think one of the things that people uh, would have caught people's eye was your thoughts on ACOs, because yep. as you'll have picked up, the, the, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of foundational idea for some of the strategy that we're pursuing. What, what lessons have you drawn from the, the ACO experiment? I know you've done a lot of research in that area. Yeah. So um, I have gone from being very skeptical of ACOs to actually kind of being a fan of ACOs, because it turns out there's this thing called evidence. And when it emerges, it's worth changing your views. Um, so ACOs, just as a quick, and I couldn't really cover it because I was trying to cover probably too much ground in that talk. Um, there are about 500 of these entities now. Um, they probably cover about 20% of the US healthcare population. So that's, that's a, they have relatively large footprint. And what we've seen is that they have started really lowering healthcare spending. What's interesting and important about them is that they, ACOs come in two flavors. Um, ACOs that have a hospital as a part of the organization, and ACOs that don't have a hospital as part of the organization. Physician-led versus hospital-led ACOs. All of the savings have come from physician-led ACOs, and the hospital-led ACOs have saved no money whatsoever. And the way physician-led ACOs have saved money is by preventing hospitalizations. And if you happen to be a hospital-led ACO, you have a real struggle preventing hospitalizations because your business model is hospitalizations. Um, so it has sort of interesting implications for when you think about ICSs here and what do you, how are you going to, what's the role of the hospital? It's really what's been driving the savings has been physician-led ACOs mm. that have figured out how to keep people out of the hospital, um, and 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 that so that has I think interesting implications for how to think about uh, some of these integrated care systems here. So how are hospitals adapting their business models, or are they just uh, crossing their fingers and hoping for the best? I think it's more the latter. Um, the, the other thing they're doing, um, and has been working quite effectively, is that they're merging. And with more market power, they can go to insurers and jack up their prices. Uh. And so what they lose in volume, they make up in price through market power. And so that's a pretty effective strategy for getting through the short run. 
Um, but it has now gotten to a point where there are lots of monopolies, very high prices, and, uh, and people really questioning what's going on. Mm. Um, in terms of the prices, I was just wondering, um, the uh, GDP per head in the US is significantly higher than many of the comparative countries you're looking at. Prices are higher. Uh, pays tend to be higher, partly because they aren't, people are, um, uh, health insurance is effectively part of uh, pay packet. If you adjust for prices, how far uh, for differences in international prices, does the US still look like such an outlier or is it just it's an expensive place so uh, healthcare is expensive? Yeah, so even when, when you, depends on how you adjust for prices, but if you do like, you know, purchasing power parity yeah. and stuff, um, all the stuff I showed you is actually adjusted for oh, purchasing right. okay. power parity. I, I, the way I think about it is, you know, so I was in, uh, I was in uh, G uh, Geneva yesterday. Uh, turns out Geneva's a pretty expensive place. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> I stopped off at a Starbucks uh, just as I was getting on the train. Uh, $9 for a little latte. Yeah. And I didn't even have the vanilla shot. Like, it was just a plain up latte. There's a, there's a little sign that says your home may be at risk if you order this coffee. Right, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and what's in interesting is that uh, an MRI in Topeka, Kansas costs twice as much as an MRI in Geneva. Mm. And you'd have to sort of think through how could that possibly be. Um, it, it, there really is a price problem that comes out of market power in the U.S. Is it just market power? Because I think the other thing that strikes one when dealing with the U.S. Power. is the sort of the, it, the sort of layer of intermediary uh, administrative function yeah, yeah. that you just you tend not to see in European health systems, uh, uh, both in terms of consultancy, advisory, uh, but also you know uh, there is people helping you maximize your revenue or control yep. your insurance costs or manage your pharmaceutical benefits. And Absolutely. So. There is no doubt that from a complexity and administrative complexity and administrative inefficiency, uh, America really has figured out how to do this better than anybody else. Um, we have, we have so our administrative cost, depending on whichever metric you use, is about twice as high as any other country. Um, so I think that's a part of it. I think it's ultimately only uh, a chunk of it. Um, I think the both market power with private insurers and political power. So it turns out hospitals are almost always the largest employer in every congressional district. Uh, Congress gets reelected every two years. And so anytime they try to, Medicare tries to do a policy where they cut prices for their doctors or hospitals, uh, Congress is happy to step in and say, please don't do that. So that even uh, we talk about having a sort of a window to make major changes in hospital. Uh, we have five year electoral terms, of course. Which about means six months. So you've got it six months. Yeah. 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 Right after the election. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, six months of that first year, you can do things. And if you miss that window, uh, we're back to election year. The other striking, uh, one, I mean, apart from the diagnostic prices, which were truly jaw dropping, was the pharmaceutical prices. Um, so there is a ban on uh, Med uh, Medicare negotiating uh, uh, with pharmaceutical companies. But, yep. but even so, those prices are quite remarkable. They are. Um, is that a reflection of the politics and the political power of the, uh, the pharma industry? Yeah. yeah, so pharmaceutical prices problem in the US come in two flavors. There's the crazy high prices of uh, brand name drugs, new drugs that come out because nobody's negotiating. And so if you want the drug, you, you pay basically whatever the uh, pharmaceutical company wants. And then we have the often very, very high prices of generics. About 85, 90% of drugs sold in the United States are generics. Um, but what has happened over time is with generics, uh, often their prices are initially too low. There only be, are one or two companies making them, let's say two companies. And then for whatever reason, one gets to buy the other one, and then they realize one morning that they have a monopoly, and they jack up their prices by 1,000%. Um, and there's no kind of political or regulatory response to that. So that's one set of issues that I think is very, very politically solvable. Um, the issue around brand name drugs and not negotiating um, has meant that America really is the driver of of both profits and innovation. To the extent that you think profits drive innovation, we can talk about that. Um, and so the big fear is if CMS starts, uh, if Medicare starts negotiating, you're gonna see profits come down, which almost surely you will. And the line that pharmaceutical companies use is that you'll see less innovation. And the answer is you might, you might. I don't think there's a free lunch here. But how much less, what kind of innovation will we I, not I, see? I seem to remember uh, Donald Light, uh, an article in BMJ, suggesting that quite a few pharmaceutical companies spend more on marketing than they actually do on product development. So yeah, and so the question, a, uh, do we think that if they get less profit, are they going to reduce their marketing and go to more towards product development? Probably not. There's no reason to, no. Uh, to think that. There's been some very good work recently that asks the question, it, it's, these are not sort of simple less profits, less innovation. It's what innovation will we miss out on, how important is it, and how much will we save, and is it worth it? Yeah. The same kind of questions that every other country asks, and I think the U.S. is finally starting to ask it. 
Um, I don't think under a Trump administration anything is going to change in 2021. But under a Sanders administration, you might get political authority to negotiate. Interesting. Let's, uh, let's take some questions before I come back and ask you about uh, your journeys around Europe. Masood, do you want to uh, uh, stick your hand up so they can see you, if you would? All right, good. Uh, thank you. That was an excellent speech. And one, one thing about the innovation and drugs. I'm an ophthalmologist, and most of our innovation happened in America. And what I've seen, those American companies then have a global reach, which then bring tax pay, for taxpayers of America significant revenue. So if you factor in the initial high-cost drugs or innovation or lens or so on and so forth, you will get more than that through global reach and, and global market. And I didn't see that in that analysis. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Any other points? Um, any other questions? Yes. Who, can't, I can't see who that is, but uh, say who Hi, you are. Good morning. Us. Rob Smith, Health Education England. Um, I'm just wondering, are supply side access uh, issues material in the system? And I'm thinking about community hospital closures and the kind of maldistribution of uh, workforce in rural and remote areas. Yeah. Um, and are there policies around scope of practice that might be being explored to, to address some of those things? I've, I follow some of your researchers and things like the opioid crisis in particular seem to be triggering some discussion about scope of practice in remote and rural areas and how that might apply to us now. We think Lincolnshire's remote, but we can see the cathedral from the A1. I know America's very different. Yeah, different type of remoteness. Good, okay. Uh, do you want to deal with those, those points? And yeah, yeah. So, you know... Um, and that's why it, I think the demonization of the pharmaceutical industry, look, pharmaceutical industry behaves very badly on, on multiple issues, and I have no interest in standing up publicly and defending them. Um, but they have been sort of singled out by the American left as sort of particularly terrible and only a kind of robbing the American purse. And I think your point about um, that there are a lot of different benefits of what the American pharmaceutical industry does, including the fact that they are global leaders and, and they are out there selling, and, and, and when they bring that money back, there are tax benefits. Um, it, it is, a, it is a, a, an innovation engine. So I think um, I am more sympathetic, and of course, I always sort of think, why do we single out the pharmaceutical industry and then leave all the hospitals completely alone? Uh, the hospitals, I actually think that the American hospitals are actually a much, much bigger problem, because there's one other problem with American hospitals. 80% of them are nonprofit. And when you're a nonprofit, you don't pay taxes. And so what you have is in cities, these large mega um, companies, corporations. Texas Medical Center in Houston has an annual revenue of $25 billion. That's a lot of money. They don't pay taxes. And so for the city of Houston and for the state of Texas, that's a huge problem. Um, so we have kind of focused on pharma and a little bit on insurance. I think we have not paid attention to everybody else, and I think there's more benefits coming out of pharma than we, uh, that we know. Um, on the issues around scope of practice, I think the, this is another area where, I hate to say it, but the Trump administration has been pretty good. Um, they've been willing to push the agenda a bit more, especially to get more care out to rural areas. But I basically think the model of what can a doctor do, what can a nurse do, what can nursing aides do, these models were developed 50 years ago. And the entire point of technology is it enables people to do different work. Right? That's what technology is useful for. It's not useful to take the work you're already doing and making it a little more efficient. That's fine. But it enables people to do different work. And we have not done that reconceptualization. And I hate to say it, a lot of it is because of doctor guilds and even nursing guilds. So nurses complain that doctors have this scope of practice rules that make it very hard for nurses to do things, and nurses are right about that. But then they have their own scope of practice things that make it very hard for anybody else to do anything that we traditionally think nurses should do. So everybody protects their turf, um, and the only people who look out for the broader public interest are, is the government. And again, I hate to say this, but the Trump administration has been like pushing on this. And I love that. And I worry that at some point, somebody in the White House is going to show up who actually knows a thing or two, and they're going to put an end to all of this. So as long as the White House is politically uh, useless, the, the agencies get to actually move the ball on some things. The advantage of being, you may be, if they're malign, it's okay as long as they're incompetent. Yeah. Right. yeah okay. Good. No, it's actually exactly. probably the biggest yeah. saving yeah. grace yeah. of the Trump administration, yeah. is that Good. they're incompetent. Uh, uh, Thea, over here, and then over here, it's just Andrea. Do you want to put your hand up again? Um, the, uh, I can't see who it is, actually. The lights are... No, it's, it's no good. Yeah, there you go. Um, Andrea, I think, is it? Yes. Yeah. Um, Andrea Sockley-Fem from Nursing Midwifery Council. When 
N Nigel did his presentation yesterday and we talked about successes in policy. Top of the list was nice. Um, and so given your thesis that price is kind of one of the real critical issues uh, uh, for American politics, is there uh, American uh, healthcare system, is there ever likely to be a nice for America? It's a great question. So um, we have ICER, yes. which, which you guys know. Um, it's not a governmental agency, and, and, and it is doing what NICE is doing, but for the pharmaceutical side, and, and, and actually uh, private insurance companies are using ICER analyses to negotiate prices. So I actually think we've got some movement happening in a classic American form. We're doing it in our own way. Um, is there any such thing happening on prices for hospitals and doctors? And the answer is no. Um, what I do think is going to happen, uh, you know, there's an old uh, say, you know, saying that Predictions are hard, especially about the future. Um, but I'll go ahead and make it. I, I think if we're sitting here in 2025, uh, we're going to be talking about how about eight or 10 states have gotten very serious about price regulation and have stepped in and really started regulating price increases or maybe even cutting prices. Um, I think that's going to happen in the classically more left of center states like Massachusetts, Maryland, uh, Minnesota. Not just the M states. Some <laughs> Um, but, but you're going to start seeing some of that. I don't see uh, a national agency like NICE uh, because we don't have consensus on this, and um, I think which is very different than, than the UK. Yeah. So here you are. Oh, sorry, I'm Thea Stein. I'm oh, it is Thea, sorry. Uh, Chief Exec yeah. of a, a yeah. community trust in, in, in England. I, I'm, I'm intrigued how the concept of outcomes get played out in the American healthcare debate and how people would or wouldn't use it to justify high price. And I'm, I'm just, just interested to know how it gets discussed within the debate. Yeah, no, it's a good question. And, and depending on which outcomes you're talking about, I mean, it's easy enough to put up like life expectancy where we're terrible. Um, though two points on life expectancy just as a, um, one of the things I do in a talk about international comparisons and life expectancies, of course, everybody knows America's life expectancy is much lower than most other high income countries. Um, but if you, Forget about America for a second and, and look at places like uh, Minnesota, uh, Hawaii, California. Um, life expectancy in Minnesota is about the same as it is in Sweden, partly because it is Sweden. Um, but, you know, um, but California's life expectancy is about the same as Canada, uh, maybe a little tiny bit less. So we do have those kinds of pockets and, and big pockets where uh, outcomes are good. On issue of whether it's the high price uh, outcomes thing, what, where people will point out is things like, if you're going to have a stroke, and I wouldn't recommend it, but if you're going to have it, um, America may be the best place in the world to have a stroke because outcomes after stroke are phenomenal in America compared to every other country. Um, partly because we have, uh, because of our high price system, we have lots and lots of pro uh, things in place that make stroke outcomes uh, quite good overall. So people will point to that, whether we need to have a neurosurgeons making $800,000 a year to, to achieve that, what if they only made 600,000? Could we still get good neurosurgeons? I suspect the answer is yes. Um, but So I think we can manage some prices without affecting outcomes. Um, but people will point to data like that. And, and, and it's, not, it's not, you can't ignore it completely. Let's take a couple of other quick questions with Anita and Stephen Dorrell. Do you want to, Stephen, do you want to go first? Uh, uh, no, I'll Stephen, Stephen thank you. And then we'll come to you. That's me. Quick, quickly, if you would, Pope, please. Yeah, uh, as you, you referred to the fact that we're developing ICSs in this country, one of the purposes of which, at least in the uh, rubric, is to embed the healthcare system more effectively in the range, in the rest of local public services, engage with local government. And I wondered whether you think that that's something you said that one of the outcomes of 2020 could be a more state-based healthcare system, more emphasis on state rights, whether that would be the opportunity uh, to address some of the social determinants rather than simply regard it as an insurance system to deal with uh, acts of God. Do you want to take a yeah. couple more and then I'll take Anita and then, yeah. Yeah, then I'm going to come back and ask you about Europe. So, uh, Anita. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask if you see a tension between the development of the more successful ACOs and the need to focus on input prices and to name it physician pay. <clears throat> because obviously you said the ACOs that have had most effect on volumes are ones that are led by doctors. <clears throat> um, because hospitals haven't voted against their own self-interest. But if the next real uh, issue in value in health, American healthcare is input prices, the people who essentially you're putting in charge, people who would have to own... 
So is there a risk that ACOs perversely are making it more difficult to address the primary issue going forward? That's a really good question. Anything else? Let's no, do those. Let's do those. Let's okay, let's do. so you know, yeah. is the issue around states and embedding it, um, I do think that's a really uh, important um, way to think about health reform. What's really clear is 320 million people, which is the population of America, is too big a population to try to do uh, a single strategy on how we're going to do healthcare delivery and then tie it to social services. So I've actually been a pretty big fan of state-led efforts and state uh, uh, customization. And when I see that happening here, I, I generally see that as a good thing. Um, with, with some overlay of just making sure that there are national standards and that uh, it's a problem in the US because state rights is a code word. So this is why things like history end up being really important. The reason why the American left hates state-led healthcare reform efforts, even though Massachusetts was that, um, is because the history in America is one of states' rights as a way to deny people well, it was really about segregation and, and, and uh, saying, well, we should be able to have slavery or we should be able to have segregation. Um, and so that code word is still there and that has really big implications for whether we're gonna allow states to do this. Uh, you know, what, what American left likes to be able to do, and I, I'm part of the American left, by the way, this is not just criticism of these crazy people, I'm one of them, uh, is we're really comfortable with Massachusetts and Minnesota doing state-based reforms. We're not so comfortable with Mississippi and Arkansas doing state-based reforms. Yeah. It's gonna be hard to get one without the other. On the ACO issue on prices, it's a really interesting question. I haven't really thought about it uh, so much, but, but what ACOs are arguing is, look, even if we're overpaying, if our prices are really crazy high, if you reduce utilization, you still save money. You know, I always say, say if the problem is you're paying too much for your pizza, okay, but if you eat less pizza, that still saves you money. Like, it's okay. Where I think the price stuff is really gonna get into, is gonna kick in, is not so much on, on primary care physician salaries. They are higher than other countries, but you're probably not gonna see big effects there. It's gonna be on the, do we need to spend twice as much in Topeka on MRIs as they do in Geneva? Could, could we get away with um, other sort of diagnostics or, or, the, or this neurosurgeon who gets paid $800,000? And the average orthopedist in America gets about 650, 670. No, we've, the got, average. we've got about one minute, one minute 30 left, according Sorry. to that ticker there. So I'm going to very quickly ask you, you've been on a tour of various bits of Europe. What have you seen so far that, you'd, that, that that's impressed you, that you and that you think you could take back? Yeah. So, you know, the motivation for this project that, that Nigel referred to uh, is a line from Uwe Reinhardt. I'll just give it and then I'll tell you my impressions. Uwe, uh, a few years ago, um, was asked about Denmark because Bernie was talking about Denmark. And, and what did he think of Denmark? And Uwe said, look, Denmark is wonderful, and I will take the Danish health system, but you must also give me the Danish political system, and it would surely help if you gave me the Danish people. <laughs> and in a way that only Uwe could do, and he did it with his beautiful accent, and I can't replicate it. But, um, so my goal has been to try to sort that out for a bunch of countries. And so I've obviously spent quite a bit of time in England. I'm gonna head up to Scotland later. Um, and then I've been in the Netherlands for a couple of weeks, and then I just spent a few days in, in, this, in Switzerland. And what is striking to me is um, how the, the narratives that we tell ourselves in England, you could not tell those narratives in the Netherlands. The, the kind of almost deep religious love of the NHS that is here, and I mean that in a good way. Like people deeply love the NHS. People in the Netherlands, I've told them stories of, of people here, and they find it all completely puzzling because for them it's much more transactional it's much more like this is what the government's role is, this is what private insurance does. And what's interesting so far has been something that may be obvious, but it's worth understanding, um, is that you can get to universal coverage with high quality and reasonable price controls in a variety of different ways. Um, but under, without understanding history and culture, it's really hard to take kind of big stuff and transplant it to another. The host will reject it. And that, and, and, Finding those stories has been has been extremely interesting. Um, still early on in this journey, and I'm happy to well, come we'll, back at we'll, some point. I think we'll get you back at some point and get you to reflect. So thank you very much it's for that tour de force. Brilliant. Thank you.